Well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here for our little Pilates Rounds group. And last week we were talking a lot about shoulders and there was so much to cover that we decided to sort of continue today with scapular stability as um, another kind of adjunct to the shoulder. So I think how we got here was because we were talking about how the shoulder is really three, we talk about three different joints at the shoulder. We talk about the AC or chromiocurricular joint, which is the clavicle and the chromium the scapula right at the top here. We talk about the glenohumeral joint, which is the actual joint of the humerus entering the glenoid on the scapula. Um, and then we also have the scapulothoracic region and mobility. And that's sort of where we, what we didn't cover last time was a lot about what about that? What does that role of the scapula play in the whole shoulder complex? And so without scapular mobility, we actually don't have full shoulder mobility. So for example, my favorite one to talk about is abduction, because we talk about abduction right as this motion here. But if we want to go past about 90 degrees of abduction, we have to have scapular mobility. We can't go any further if our scapula doesn't move. So if you actually feel that as I go up, my scapula has to travel down, right? It has to rotate and travel in that abducted way, the angle of the scapula going in that abduction. Right? So we actually call, if you want to call this pole motion, we actually more commonly call it scaption because it's the abduction plus the scapular motion so scaption, right? Pure abduction is really speaking abduction of the shoulder without that scapular mobility. And that just speaks to the glenohumeral humeral joint. So even in a forward flexion, right, there is some downward rotation of that scapula as we go into full shoulder flexion, less so than with the, less apparent than with the abduction, but definitely there. So um, if you guys remember, so, so the, the mobility of the scapula is a key, but also the stability of the scapula is a key. We did talk about serratus last time too, and how that plays a role that if serratus anterior, which is you know hitting the anterior side of the scapula and attaching to the root cage here, right? So if the serratus anterior is not functioning right, what you get is that sort of leaning off of the back of the scapula, the medial border of the scapula, sort of just pops off the back when there's pressure through the arm. So rather than creating more stability for that shoulder complex, it's actually an instability issue that we would want to address. So that, that's how we kind of landed that scapular stability. And I think it's a huge piece in rehabilitating any, any shoulder, but there's the scapular stability for our shoulder injury that we want to talk about. And then there's the Scapular, maintaining scapular mobility for people who are in the aging population. So, for example, scapular mobility would be affected by a very kyphotic spine, thoracic spine. Right? So if you imagine that um, kyphosis coming in, right, then the scapula tend to abduct the shoulders roll forward. So what we would want to do is create strength and stability for that the scapula in a uh, rhomboid activity, so in adduction of the scapula is going to help create that lift and out of that thoracic kyphosis, right? Or at least keep the shoulders open even if the kyphosis is existing. So that we don't also end up with the shoulder impingement in the front and all kinds of issues here. So all that being said, I, I do a lot of work. We have a lot of great Pilates exercises for shoulder stability, shoulder organization, and scapular stability. And when I think of shoulder stability, we talked about the rotator cuff muscles, but it doesn't end there. Right? It, it actually has to include scapular stability as well. And so serratus, and serratus presses we talked about on with a the theraband behind and that root cage contraction to assist. We talked about them supine, pressing up. We talked about them in quadruped and we talked about them in half plank, full plank. Those are all great places to practice scapular stability. And I had mentioned that that's also one of my favorite ways 
to strengthen and approximate the shoulder into the socket as well for the shoulder itself. So I think you guys know all those already, right? Yeah, yeah. So I don't think we need to necessarily review those, but maybe think through what exercises will strengthen the upper back and the scap create scapular stability or proper proper motion and stability in the upper back, right? I think those are things we really didn't cover as much. But if you think to, so we've modified a lot of things now to be on the mat, but if you think about what, the, what most of those exercises that we've been doing are, um, do you guys wanna share what exercises come to mind for you? Um, so we were talking about um, the, keeping the shoulder blades together, um, like as the, you, you bring the arms up over the head. One of the things that um, I remember we used to do a long time ago with, um, do you remember the couple that used to come in that uh, the husband was a, a psychiatrist? He was like 90. Yeah. And he was practicing. Yeah. Okay, so I remember his wife had the the really the kyphosis and she was very forward. So one of the things we used to do with her was um, sit at the end of the uh, uh, the Cadillac, but we would like build a little chair for her to do, um, to be able to pull the, the roll down bar down um, and squeeze the shoulder blades together and try to like get this back a little more. I don't know if that would be one. I actually did that with a client last week. Yeah. But it's you know being able to to kind of move the arm this way without reaching up and using the um, the traps as much yeah yeah so definitely i think um so that was kind of like the chicken wings type idea or a lap pull the controversy behind that is that you want when people are doing anything that's coming down in here you don't want them to lose their head forward to try to get the bar behind their head. So a lot of people will do it now to the front of the chest. I still like, if they have the mobility of the shoulders to go back, I like them to try and go back, but only if they can keep the head there and not going forward to get the head, um, to get the bar behind the head. But yeah, so anything that will down. So that, that speaks to a lot of things, that lat pull or lower trapezius and lat pull are some of my favorites for proper shoulder organization, really, the whole shoulder complex. So you could do that, uh, you know, I have a springboard right here. You could do it with springboard. You could do it with um, Cadillac. You could do it with a TheraBand. If you had a place to attach a TheraBand higher up. So we used to do it on the end of the Cadillac to avoid having some of our elder side sit on the floor, but you could have seated on the floor, right? And then doing a little pull down here. You know, it's hard for you guys to see, I'll angle myself, even though you would be really parallel, but a pull down here so that you're collecting the strength and the work from the scapula traveling down. So I usually cue this not as an arm pull, that's very different than the arm pull tends to lift the shoulder up, but as an, the, the shoulder blade sliding down the back, creating that, and then the elbow getting heavy, right? So that creates that tension down, but my shoulder, upper shoulder and upper trap did not even kick in. It's just really learning to activate those lower muscles. And a lot of lower trapezius work a lot in tandem. So you can think of them pretty much doing the same thing in that sort of action. So one of my favorites is like what you were talking about first, Allison, is basically this exercise, right? Pulling this down to the big button, my point is it's getting flat. But being able to do this sort of motion is great. Same activity, right, at the shoulder blades traveling down. So this part traveling down to create that motion, keeping that posture right. Or if they can't, you could take them all the way back and have them just create that here just in front of their face, right? You can do also the one on the Cadillac with the metal bar, holding the edges of the metal bar and pulling down this way. That one's really nice because it really helps. And then sometimes when people can't activate in this downward pattern, 
what's nice is to actually have them hold on and pull down. And then because they're down there, they can activate better at that lower range and then have them just go up a little bit without the shoulders traveling upward, right? Without that squeezing upward thing happening. So they're down here. When they're down, they can feel that they're active and squeezing the elbows in. And then they just slowly start to release upward without releasing the upper traps to do the work. Right, so those upper traps I often call the big dummy, one of the big dummy muscles of the body. I, mean, I feel like if we could just cut out upper trap and cut out rectus abdominis and maybe cut out psoas, ooh, that might just totally disconnect us. But you know the idea of not overworking hip flexors, not overworking upper shoulder, and not overworking rectus. I think we have a much more functioning body, <laughs> a better functioning body altogether. We could get those smaller muscles to do the work. And if you think of the fibers of, of the muscles, I'm really big on remembering where the direction of the muscle fibers goes. So if upper trap's going this way, it's gonna elevate. When it shortens, it's gonna elevate and squish inward, right? Lower trapezius has the opposite fiber direction. So if I want to counter the upper trapezius, I wanna activate the lower trapezius. And then lats have these beautiful like all the way, remember a lot, is to the shoulder, right? And under here, right? In that nice little diagonal pattern. And then all the way down. So here, here, and then all the way down into my thoracolumbar fascia here at the top of the to the top of the iliac crest. So that's just a huge muscle. And one of its main functions is would be, I like to think of it as a pull-up muscle or we used to call it, when I used to do the circus, the wingspan, right? You've got big wings, the lats create that wingspan, that wide back string that we have, yeah, right there. So activating lats, activating lower trapezius, really help that downward rotation of the scapula and that stability for the shoulder when we need to elevate the arm so that we're not in this every time. So that is a great thing. And so the tools would be single arm lap pose, double arm lap pose on the springboard or on the Cadillac. Those are all great exercises for that. Yeah, so that is definitely one huge factor in proper shoulder mechanics. The other one would be rhomboids. So activating rhomboids is basically rolling, right? Remember rhomboids, attachment points are medial scapular border. So we Medial scapula to uh, th to transverse processes of the thoracic spine. So basically, the run of the medial scapula, the run of the scapula border, and its action is to pull the scapula towards the midline. So, what I choose that has come to mind with that are pretty self explanatory and also very present in the Pilates repertoire, right? So, any, so we've got our rowing. Chest expansion is one of them. And, and when I do, I've been doing a lot of different things with the bands, just again, because we're virtual and not most of the time right now. But any of these, we went over this one before, where your band's just at your thigh and you're pulling backward, knuckles down and squeezing towards the midline. Uh, but in the back. So I'm squeezing the shoulder blades towards my middle as I pull back. That's the straight arm rowing you could do. You could, and that's kind of mimicking chest expansion if you're on the springboard with the bar. That would be what this is closest to. But I do like to encourage people to take the hand behind the body. So if you have handles, I actually prefer those because when you go behind the body, I really feel like that helps the shoulder not stay forward. Uh, it really helps find that backward uh, posterior shoulder or positioning. So uh, I usually have people work behind the body to feel that activation in the upper back more. So one is that. The other would be kind of the straight arm. By the time that was kind of straight arm one, but here is another version of it would be rolling here. Right, and making sure that I'm not going forward, right? really pulling back. 
it could be a nice way. And then the other way is to pick up slack here and pull um, into a bent elbow room. Now, I do this on the mat because I don't have much choice when people are at home with a bear man. But honestly, I prefer to spring them from above and pull this way when we do rowing. And the reason for that is because of the line of pull, right? So if I'm pulling from down to up, the fibers that want to fire are going to want to be my upper fibers. Whereas if I pull from up to down, the fiber muscle fibers that are going to want to fire are going to be my down fibers. So for example, we use the springboard a lot, and, and or like Allison to do the tower with the band up higher to pull at an angle downward. I really prefer that. So you could use the top of the catalog, for example. You could use the springboard high up, or what we do often here is that hinge back. So part of the roll down, but I often do it without the roll down, but just this hinge back idea of the rowing. And then I've got my, I want to hinge back enough that my arms are in the line of the spring. And now when I pull, I automatically go down. I don't really have the tendency to go up anymore. I'm really right here down and releasing it upward, down and up and hinging. Yeah, so it really helps me get into the middle trapezius, lower trapezius, rather than upper trapezius. I feel like I'm in a constant battle with upper trapezius when it comes to shoulder, proper shoulder mechanics and function with, with life, with everything, a daily life, with stress, computers, driving. <laughs> so anything I can do to go downward and lower is really my preference. So rowing for rhomboids is a super key, I think, to also creating that good stability for the shoulder and scapular region. Um, quick question. Yeah. Um, when it comes to those overhead reaches, um, is there, there's people who I've worked with who they seem to get the down motion and they're able to activate like that but for whatever reason, when they come up above that 90 degree point, that, that's when upper trapezius just, they can't seem to shut it off. Would that be, um, or like, or, or the cueing just isn't making sense. I'm not sure which one it is. Um, Cause a lot of times I'll, I'll kind of do that like feeling of down to go up. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that makes sense to everybody, but um then my other thought was to maybe like, would it make sense to take something over the shoulder to kind of tamp it down to feel, to kind of give you that feeling? I don't know if that would be beneficial or not. Um, I think you could. I think it would depend on what you're seeing. Um, and how well the person responds to any sort of feedback. Uh, this reminds you not, at least it gives resistance if they try and go up, so they at least notice that they are trying to go up. One of my favorite cues is to take it, the elbows wider. So when I'm gonna go back up, to say if I, So if I had them like this, or say this was in that springboard, the, the, the Cadillac bar, for example, I could pull down. And you're right, most people get this better, especially when they get down here. They can actually get the elbows in tight and the shoulders will go down with them. But then when you go back up, you see this comes with it when they get past a certain point. So a lot of times I'll now cue it as, okay, pull down, keep the shoulder blades down, now widen the elbows. So keep going wide with the elbows. As they go wide, there's an opening of that back. So if I try and reach my elbows, I'm really trying to stretch my elbows as wide as I can possibly make them. And then as I'm stretching wide, it's really hard to also go up with the shoulders. So I'll even hold on to those elbow tips and pull a little bit like gentle. I never really yank or anything, just kind of suggest 
but they go wider by holding on to the edges of those elbows, and guiding them kind of wider. Then it makes it really hard for them to also go upward if they're trying to go wide. And that gets them out of the upper. Or, you know, or just keep them at that lower range until they start to understand it. So just, you know, we're only going to come up to here and then go back down until you really feel like, oh, wait. Then they start to think, oh, I can feel work down in here. Now keep that work as your arms, allow the arms to go back up rather than um, allow just the arms to go back up but keep the shoulders down, it can happen. Yeah, but you're right, it is a really, it can be super challenging with people. So I'll just keep them low or try the wide. Yeah, like that wide cue. Is that one I had thought of before? Yeah. I agree with Genevieve. I, and is there a good cue for firing your lower traps? Because I, it's like one of the hardest things, like I'll touch them there, I'll say like, pull, like try to pull down, try to pull your shoulders down, try to feel it. And I've just got so many people that they just can't connect to that, like the, the lower trap firing and not the upper trap. Yeah, I mean, I think it's patterning over time. It's just said to become such an ingrained pattern that it's hard for people to shift out of that pattern. But I think that just that constant reminder and in that lower range, like not allowing them to get into the upper range because the upper range is so easy for that. You can't activate lower, like it's really hard here. I can't get to lower trapezius if I'm here. So if you can actually get them into that there and then have them stay there no matter what the arm does, even if it's like a little tiny action. And then we start making that action bigger and bigger. Um, and I think remembering the fiber directions for lower trapezius is really helpful so that you're thinking about, okay, they're going to contract going down here when it contracts, it's going to shorten that way. So motions that help encourage that are going to be your best bet or things like I said, you know, hinge back rowing rather than rowing from down to up. That'll really make a difference. Um, so get the, if you're going to try rowing, have it be high up like you did on the top of the Cadillac or on top of the tower or hinged back with the springboard, something, and get them in that line of pull where they're pulling this way so they can actually feel that they want to get down in here and then try and get them more and more vertical and the, you know, the level. So they start to develop the awareness that way. I think that's really the only way that I can think of doing it. It can be really tedious. <laughs> I just have a question um, regarding on the, like the, what you're talking about on the Cadillac, you know how sometimes we put people on the box for the, the bar pulling down and hinge back at an angle. So, I mean, I'll just speak for myself, like the times that I've done it, um, I guess I'm not really getting the activation. I feel like a lot in my shoulders and I'm never, w whether I'm never sure whether to ring it, the bar lower or not hinge back so much or maybe sit on something higher i'm not just like i just or maybe i just don't have any connection you know there so i'm just trying to figure it out um when you've done the hinge back rowing yeah of you know the cadillac when it's the sprung from the bar on the top mm -hmm. uh, you may not be getting in the right line of pull mm. if, if the line of pull is downward i think it'd be really hard to go into your upper trapezius and get it. So your body may not be in the right line. So, and then there's also what, what actually you just did there, your neck tensed as soon as your body went back. And if that's happening, that's a whole nother story. So um, maybe checking that head position too. I wouldn't, um, yeah, checking that head position and seeing if you can Put the head in a better line. Um, I'm just trying to think of, I'm trying, it's hard to imagine without seeing you do it, what's going on. But yeah. that's something we should do is watch you do it and see what happens when you go. Um, but yeah, I think, I think generally what goes wrong is the person isn't hinged back enough. Mm -hmm. So that line of pull is not at the right angle. So you want to be, like I said, in line. The, the springs 
in the same, if my springs are in that line, then that's the line I hinge in until I'm flat and then I open the chest. I really, I don't do it this way. I won't if I'm trying to pull the bar or maybe even pulling the bar lower, not so high on the body, lower down on the body could help too. Yeah, I'm not sure like here. I mean, I feel like I'm keeping in good alignment, but just for what whatever reason, it just feels like the only connection I have is up here. So I guess, I mean, maybe something like trying it with a band or something might be something a little bit uh, easier to focus into. Yeah, or even, um, I was thinking maybe placing yourself on a wedge where you have support, but then it's really hard to get the elbows back. But yeah, yeah. Support along the head and neck that could help you um or you know the other way might be to do it um this way so that we're on all fours so on all fours here right pulling this way or then pulling the elbows here i think mm. it's hard to get that up in this position too so elbow pulling towards my hip I feel like I'm pulling in an angle that way, even though it's coming up, but I'm trying to pull back away. Working on something like this to get that activation, I really can't feel this working. If I'm doing that, I really feel it all here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just, I'll have to experiment with it. Um, but it's, I mean, I guess also, cause my, sh my left shoulder is a little bit funky. Like even when I, I'm lying down on the springboard to do, you know, pulling, Lying down, you know, pulling the, the arms come to your sides to get that pec lat stretch, maybe even the swan, like that even bothers my neck, just the, the height of that and the pull. Um, so I actually have been experimenting a little bit um, with putting the strap just, sorry, you can't say, under like my bust, like just lying down and having, and then doing the A, Y, and T and having that. Like usually I, I put, if I put my arms in front of me, is that the Y, I guess the Y position, like I just feel all funky in my shoulders, but I tried it with the strap and kind of pulling, it just really, it was nice to put, it, it got my shoulders in place and I still got that support there too. So it was just an interesting experiment to feel. I'm like, oh, my shoulders are not hurt when I do that. Yeah, so here it comes, so what is now coming in my head is me you don't have enough scapular mobility. If your scapula aren't able to get down, then you're gonna strain in the neck region, in that upper region. Mm. Even working on something like getting enough scapular downward motion in order to then activate the muscles down there. So one of my favorite these days is just like simple, you can do it with a roller or without a roller, but the more simple is even without the roller. But laying down here and forehead kind of, I like to hover my head, but you could forehead down. I, I feel like when I hover, I get a little more length at the back of the neck. But then I've been working a lot with people just reaching far away intentionally and then sliding the shoulder blades in their socket and trying to feel the back of the neck grow long. So that gives my scapula that downward motion and then trying to keep them in their sockets and open up with it. So I'm still pulling forward because that pull forward really puts those shoulder blades down my back and then releasing, reaching along and starting over the shoulder blades down in the socket. And mm. So this it's might help. It, it's a lot of work in that same lower, lower area activating. You could do it with the roller it's getting a little more e easier to see here, right? And roller, roller, and here. But I feel this a lot more. And I've now started calling this my sphinx pose. I'm sure it's still that means it's somewhere, but elbows digging in, neck is long. So working on being in this position, right? Even if I want, I can have the arch there or I can lift up and take the arch away and have this sphinx pose. I'm working hard, I won't be able to see her all that long because I'm really working down in here to connect and create that motion and mobility. So maybe even working on opening more and then coming back to that. Because yeah. it, 
if that scaffold is stuck, then it's going to be really hard for you to get into the upper, uh, to get out of the upper. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's just really interesting, the stabilization and then the mobility. It's just like how much they go together. I just didn't realize that so much, but they, yeah, they like, they really kind of work in tandem. Yeah. Yeah. And the only time I think that I really, I mean, with the, like a rotator cuff tear, you can, you still want to work on scapular mobility and stability and you can do that safely. Even with a subluxed shoulder, I don't work on mobility. So for example, I wouldn't be doing pec lat stretch. I wouldn't be doing anything behind my head here, but I'd still be doing a mild version of that connection and lat pulling. You just have to watch that. You don't want them to go past um, their body, right? So my elbow will never travel behind me in this external rotated position for an unstable subluxing shoulder. But you can still do a lot of the same exercises in a small, safe range for a scapular stability. That's such a big key. And then, of course, those rotator cuff exercises for rotator cuff tear, or even for a um, subluxed shoulder, you would definitely do those just to stabilize the glenohumeral joint as well. I've been playing around a little bit with uh, that same, you know, A T W Y stuff. Um, but doing it sort of unilaterally, which feels interesting. Um, I don't know how specifically useful it is for, I mean, certainly for, for scapular stability and, and that work, but also it's, I've been doing it quadruped. Um, and trying to find that activation working unilaterally has just been kind of interesting for me. So like, finding um, the, the path between the shoulder blades and holding onto that, but at the same time working the uh, scapular retraction on the other side. Mm -hmm. uh, and then trying to stabilize through the middle, of course. Um, it's just, I think, brings a few more things into it. Um, and then doing, you know, your A, your W, really it's a half W like a V, and then your half T there. Um, then it feels like quite a bit of work just holding that arm out to the side. Um, I don't know, that's just something that I've been playing with on my own. Yeah, I, I like those a lot in any way, shape, or form. Um, I find the why I don't use very often because I find that that is really hard to not have your crunch and upper trap kick in. But while we're on the quadruped idea, I, um, I've been thinking about serratus anterior much like I think about glute medius. And so glute medius, we talk about in standing, right? If, I, if I'm to stand up and if I really wrap and get my glute medius underneath me and stand up, really tall, I actually should be able to just float this other foot just off the surface of the floor, right, in stance, because I'm active and strong and tall in this glute medius. So I can do that with glute medius, but I should also be able to do that with serratus in quadruped, I feel like. So if I, we've been doing, I've been doing a lot of bird dog or pointed dog type exercise, but if I, the way I like to cue it is send, I'll send my left leg out. Now my left arm is sort of at base for me because I don't have the left leg. So here I need to pick up and push that floor away. But when I do that, it totally frees up this right arm. And I haven't, I'll do the other side so you can see better, but I haven't rotated, I just pressed the floor away. So I'm, I'm really not, I'm not rotating. I'm just pushing, and then it's giving me that freedom here, no matter what I do, but this arm is totally free now because I've got that stability happening um, in that serratus, actually, on that on the stance, stance side. So it's almost like serratus and glute medius have that same function in stance, if you would, that same stabilizing, holding you up function. So uh, serratus is a great uh, 
muscle for that. And then once you have that, that's the stability that you're talking about, Jenny, pushing away, right? I can then find room for this arm and it's doing something different than what this arm is gonna do in mobilizing, especially if I start working in a range, right? I'm doing something totally different side to side and having to work both sides in a different way, uh, which is great. So that's a really nice one. The other one, go ahead, Allegra. Oh, I was just gonna say, I found on those also when I put um, some energy into my pinky finger. I mean, also, you know, generally I say put, you know, sort of like open, spread your fingers and have the weight sort of in between your thumb and first finger. But I find also when I direct some energy towards my pinky finger, it really helps me kind of turn on that tricep serratus kind of more. So, um, I've just been feeling more connection with that. I don't know if you've ever experimented with that or anything in that bird dog pose. I, I never thought of it as pinky finger, but I do spread out the hands a lot. And then when I was just trying it, there is that spiral, right? So it's again, kind of like the spiral in the root media and the leg and the foot. There's sort of this spiraling inward around that happens in order to push away from the floor. It's not just pushing straight up. If I push straight up and my elbow's out, I get this. I don't get that wrap and press. It's the same thing in stance, right? If I stand here and I just push, I don't get much. But if I wrap and press, I do. So it's this wrapping this way on the leg. It's the same, the arm is wrapping yeah, the spiraling motion. Oh, that's cool. So that that spiral would take me in my foot. It picks up the arch of the foot. Takes me not. I don't roll to the outside of my feet, but it takes me some weight across all the toes and to the pinky side. And same thing in the hand. That spiral takes me into this direction. If I would let my hands go, they would go that way. If I let my feet go, they would go that way. Okay, that's a good way to think about it. Okay, cool. Thanks. Not disconnect, right? Sort of that same thing to get to get away from the floor in both cases. That's actually a great. Yeah, I never thought about doing that in quadruped, but a lot of times I will um, <clears throat> cue the pinky when they're using like the roll down bar for chest expansion to get them to like more into their lats and less, you know, out of their shoulders. So it's kind of the same idea of getting everything curled under here, so to speak, or spiraled. Yeah. So, I mean, we could take off talking about all the diagonal lines in the body, but maybe, you know, my favorite one, and it's completely simpl simplified from all the cross body fascial lines, and, uh, but I just like to think of two big X's duct taped onto my body. Right. So so simple and not 100% accurate, but if you think about, right, I can take duct tape and go from here. I talk about it all the time from the opposite oblique to the hip. I duct tape that, duct tape that, and then if I could do it on the back, I would actually take it from way up under my armpit and go all the way down my butt around my leg. I could duct tape that and the other, and then I'd be like totally supportive and stable. I <laughs> have everything glued together in the right way. And if you think about obliques are diagonal, lats are diagonal, in that probably we're so diagonal. Um, the only really vertical muscles I think are probably quads are pretty vertical, hamstrings are pretty vertical, and then like the lateral leg muscles are pretty vertical, but then even there, you have one that crosses the foot here and one that crosses the foot there, so to be honest, interior. And to the else posterior and wait, sorry. Yes, to the else posterior crosses underneath the foot here into the arch. And the which one is it? Flexor. Oh, now I'm not coming, it's not coming to me. Proneus longus and tibialis anterior? Okay, I'll find it. Proneus longus and tibialis posterior. They cross basically underneath the foot and so they create that sling. Um, underneath the foot to all those diagonal lines 
happen um, through the leg, through the hip, through the back, and out the shoulder. The other way that I've done this to get their shoulder down is by having them stand on a band and really have it tight down. Um, so really picking up flat and then rolling the shoulder so that I feel like it's pulling me downward and backward. So here I can really feel that and then I can take some of the tightness off and try and do a bicep to let the elbows be the anchor down. So this really helps. I don't want to be in that total um, arch. I want to stay connected in there, but I can have this back and feel that pull downward and down the back of me here. So that is another way I've been trying to cue that downward motion with then a little bicep curl to get some upward motion that makes them feel that they can still anchor down even as they're going up. And then the other one, I actually prefer it with a the TheraBand than anything else, is the clean. And the reason I like it with TheraBand is because, I can do the kneeling too, is because I can press the band backwards with my shoulder blades or the tips of my shoulder blades down as my arms come up when I have the band behind me. So I can have it right at the tips of the shoulder blades and try and hook the shoulder blades on the band and then release. Right, so I'm pressing back into that band, trying to lower it with my shoulder blades as my arms come up. And then I take the focus off the lifting arm part, and I really get that pendulum feeling that the scapula is traveling downward and the hands coming upward. So I always talk about that as a big pendulum with the weight of the pendulum being the scapula, the big weight part, and the arm is being the light part. So as that weight goes down, the arm goes up. But here with the TheraBand, I can actually connect that, press the scapula into the TheraBand, and let the arm go up. I don't know if that makes sense to you guys, but that's another one that I really like for that lowering part and reaching upward. Yeah, it almost feels with that one, like your shoulder blade is traveling forward. Is that right? <laughs> Am I feeling that right? <laughs> Forward into your back, the angle of it. So the angle being the very bottom of it. Right. Going down and into your back. Yeah. yeah. Like it's, I mean, it's obviously traveled outside a little bit with the serratus press. Mm -hmm. Right. And then it's kind of doing that. It's going, yeah. So if I had it on your, this is the back and I had it on the back. As the arm travels that way, Right, the, this is going that way, potentially, in, uh, and then it allows that arm to swing. Yeah, so it's that action. And that action helps let the arm go up without the shoulder, because you can't have that action. If I want to get the, sh if I want to lift up the shoulder, all that my scapula is doing, so if I just go to lift up the arm, all the scapula is going to do is go like this, and then my shoulder goes with it. Right? It won't be this down to go up. That's the down to go up, right? It won't be this motion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, maybe you can try some of these things and tell me what you think at, on some clients and see how that goes. Can I um, suggest something for next time? Do you always pick a body part or can it be, for example, scoliosis, like working with clients that have scoliosis? Could that be a possible... Topic. That can be a possible topic. Is that the topic you would love? All right, we can talk about scoliosis. I will tell you right now that in one hour, I will not get very far at all with scoliosis, <laughs> but it would be a great start. Okay, yay, thank you. Okay, guys. Thank you so much for being here. Um, have a great week, and we will see you next time.